I recently saw a video by Vokta where I wonder how often he gets to hear Danes pronounce that anyway where he pointed out that one of his friends who happened to be gay was clearly a nice person and I saw a video by Eli aka Tim Warren's girl in which she talked about being lesbian or said that she was and then a video by Angie the anti-theist in which she talks about her experiences as a bisexual and actually facing discrimination even from people who she would have you would think would accept her for that anyway this inspired me to also talk about you know that your sexuality does not decide whether you're a nice person or not I mean if you don't consider I'm sorry I don't remember his name tattoo something it was the first time I saw him Vokter's friend Tremoyne Squirrel or Angie the Anti-Theist to be just amazing people okay I, I don't know tattoo man well enough to say if he is amazing but he seems like a really nice guy then I don't you know if if you can't see that about them then I don't even know what to say to you I'm straight myself I don't mind if anyone thinks I mean I know I've been talking a lot about homosexuality recently and I don't always make it a point to announce my sexuality I don't really I'm you know I feel secure with my sexuality so what I will do is mention some people that I know that aren't straight. I'm not going to be giving any personal information. The first one is a bisexual man and he's one of the smartest, most cultured and most prolific people I know. And I've never experienced any sense around him that he was you know trying to make a pass at maybe not so much me I'm he's more my father's age but my father I know him from my father they're friends since childhood and my father has found out that he's bisexual and also doesn't have a problem and they live together in a boarding school we're talking day and night this school they didn't have any contact with girls for the years they were there. They only left the boarding school during vacations, you know, to be with their family. And not once did my father ever feel like, you know, he was trying to you know, seduce him or anything. And if you're saying, well, maybe he didn't know he was bisexual back then, or maybe he didn't dare act on it, well, how about today? He still isn't doing anything. They're very good friends. And the other one, I don't know as well, and I don't know for sure if he is gay. But again, I won't be giving out any personal information. I went to school with him. 
not for terribly long. It... I don't remember exactly if he was leaving the school before me. I, anyway, there was a rumor in school that he was gay, and I didn't care at all. I don't know how much the others cared. I don't think I ever heard about him being bullied or anything, but he may very well have been. He may just have been Metro, I don't know. He was... not sure I'd quite say effeminate, but he wasn't, you know, all macho and such, but he was a really nice guy. And If he was gay, I never felt like he was leering at me or trying to make a pass at me or anything. I never felt uncomfortable around him. I mean, not even like, you know, sneak in a hug, pretend it's just a friendly hug, or anything. Nothing. And I think part of the idea of those who do have a problem with people for their sexuality or transgenders or all anything like that, LGBTs, I think it's the idea that it's wrong and evil and that you can somehow destroy something that, like I mentioned in an earlier video, like a virus, how you can, you know, okay, maybe a disease, you know, you can keep it out if you, you know, through good hygiene, for example, you know, and other than the fact that there is no real reason for this, other than some ideas that are from back when everybody had to have as many children as possible, and obviously it didn't help if you were, you know, incapable of having children. But then again, you know, whenever a couple couldn't conceive, it was supposed to be the woman's fault, and we know today that it may very well have been the man's fault, you know. I believe a king of England once actually started his own religion to get away from Catholicism. You know, he... a... Reformed Church? I don't remember the exact word. You probably know what I'm talking about. Like, the Lutheran Church is not Catholic, you know. Just to get out of having to cut the head of his second wife. I think it was at least second. Because the Pope, you know, Catholicism, demanded that she be killed because divorce was a sin. And she couldn't give him boy children. You know, she couldn't, you know, birth any boys for him. And one could argue that today we know that that was actually his problem, you know, the whole chromosome thing. I don't quite know if that's how it was. I seem to remember that it was that he eventually did get a son from another woman. Anyway. That was why it was initially thought of as evil and wrong. And there's no reason today. It's not like homosexuals are more likely to be cruel to animals or to other people. Sexually frustrated men are... little hint there for you. So are abused women, possibly. You know, everybody who's abused may take it out on someone else. Not everyone does, but you know, and 
trying to prevent people from living the way that they want to is not going to make them very happy now, is it? I would like to know if you did somehow destroy homosexuality, what would you do? What, what exactly are you going to do once all the problems of the world are solved? As many of them by blowing stuff up and, you know, destroying and killing that and those that somehow infect others with, you know, this behavior which we now know is largely genetic. Glee. Conditioned. I don't remember the words. Anyway, it's, you know, based on your genetic makeup. Would you just, you know, lean back and just enjoy life because now there are no problems? Do you really actually believe that that's realistic? I've never understood this whole, the belief in heaven, the belief that there is an existence that has no problems. What would you do exactly? Do you not enjoy the vacation in virtue of the fact that there are work days afterwards? It's a break. It's a pause in between. I mean, if you just don't want to work, then, you know, well, once you're dead, you don't work. You won't work. Part two, you don't work. Anyway. That didn't sound as lewd in my head, I swear. Sorry about that. I mean, what would you do? Do you really think you would enjoy never having to do anything at all? Part of the joy of life is working towards a solution. It's the journey, it's not the destination. Have you noticed how everybody worldwide, if you supply work, quite a lot of people will actually work. Even if they have a bastard for a boss. Even if they have low wages. Okay, granted, some of them have to work. But recently on the news here, it was revealed that stores that have fired, or, you know, from where people have retired from working. You know, once they reach, don't remember, 67, around that age, you know. The stores want these workers back. Because they know what they're, you know, they know what the job is. They're gonna do it. They are more punctual than teenagers, you know. And the retired people often do want to work also, if they physically and mentally can. You know, if, you know, their memory is intact. If, you know, they don't have arthritis or something that prevents them from doing the work. They want to. It's what we do. We, we're here to work. We're here to do stuff, you know? I've never met anyone who never did anything but, well, yeah, never did anything, basically. I mean, maybe you could make a case for, like, drug addicts, but they are trying to run away from life, you know. I would argue that in most cases they've probably tried to do work, they've tried to do something, and it just didn't seem to work out. Maybe they can't take the pressure, you know. They're trying to run away, and you know, without dying. And just enjoy their life, and maybe they feel that that's the only way they could. Yeah, I guess that's it for this one.